Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp. Today, we're going to be talking about a lot of different things from news. City is talking about um, making uh, uh, the Higgins Avenue corridor a little bit uh, safer for those of you traveling uptown off the hip strip. Um, let's jump right into news. One of the big things going into the finals, so the finals, uh, the World Cup soccer final is going to be happening Sunday, December 18th at 8 a.m. Uh, Montana Standard Time. It's going to be against Argentina and France for the finals. So through back and forth and a lot of things going who knows where, a lot of upsets, a lot of things moving forward. It seems like uh, my team, Argentina, from uh, my old NES days, uh, are going to be playing against France for the World Cup. We'll see how that all works out. So jumping right in, um, as of right now, the Ukraine-Russian conflict is at a strategic halt, and the Russians have hung back and are bombing infrastructures, which include power water lines alike. Ukraine's Prime Minister Denir Samir uh, is also looking for Patriot missiles, which will be used as anti-missile defense systems. Organizers in France expect more than 45 nations and 20 international institutes to take part uh, in the parents' conference starting Tuesday to raise and coordinate aid for Ukraine's water, power, food, health, and transportation needs during these tough winter months. Um, while all rail workers are forced to work because uh, striking is considered illegal in the United States, uh, when it comes to other countries like the UK, they are dealing with a potential strike that is moving forward. Uh, the uh, National Union of Rail, Maritime and Transportation Workers, RMT as it's going to be called, uh, plan to work walk out this week and reject a 5% raise this year and a 4% raise next year, uh, which the union more than 60% rejected. The RMT leadership has uh, recommended its membership reject the last latest pay offer, which network rails have described as the best and final offer. The UK government is not doing anything and it seems the workers may have actually leverage in this case. But what does it mean to really have leverage in this day and age? You know, workers have been chosen to stay and ride out the COVID wave, have been picking up extra workloads left by the void of workers laid off during the pandemic. A lot of those problems of unemployment can be solved if you employ enough people and not make your current staff work twice as hard for frankly the same pay. The COVID bump helped a lot of businesses that benefited keeping people indoors and buying stuff. The best times for workers in society as a whole happened when places like Ford Motor Company started to lift wages and pioneer the nine to five job, AKA the eight hour work day with a guaranteed $5 a day. This is like way back in the day monies. Um, for those of you who don't know, Ford Motor Company was the reason why places like Detroit became such a major metropolis. It was when manufacturing began and everyone had a Ford in those days. My point is simple. Working class that is strong, stay strong is in Dillis Strong's community. Uh, part of the Daily Montana. Uh, so that's uh, that's kind of what I want to end it on that as well. There's a lot of ongoing things happening here and there. And, you know, uh, unions have been exploding like left and right in different organizations. And I just wanted to kind of leave it on the idea that um, the more people have power, the more powerful society is in a way. So anyways, Part of the uh, Daily Montana, a judge ruled against an anti-vax law that was passed on the state of the heels of the COVID-19 restrictions. This was back in uh, the 2021 legislature for the state of Montana. And uh, this would accommodate those who have refused vaccines and forced health care workers to treat folks regardless. Those who cannot take the vaccine are left immunely, uh, immunely compromised and are an exception, but allowing for folks who can but won't take a vaccination in general to risk exposure to health care staff cannot refuse service based on protecting others. So that's what this law was kind of about is like you're so part of this is that U.S. District Court Judge Donald uh, Molly said that uh, provisions that affect health care settings from hospitals to doctors offices to nursing homes are illegal because the law treats those health care settings differently, creating different requirements for the same classes of health care employees. So in a lot of ways, these health care institutes have to remain their own uh, um, have to have their own rules and their own policies that can potentially supersede government from overreaching their power. So this is the quote that they said that um, M Judge Malloy said, the resolution in this case does not turn on whether vaccines are safe and affected, but rather whether House Bill 702 is uh, preemptive by federal law or is unconstitutional. It is in both instances, says Malloy. 
it, this is uh, this had to do with the uh, employees and folks who are able but not willing to uh, in the healthcare settings as well. Um, Gianforte is planning of upwards of uh, seven, 300, oh geez, let me start that over. Uh, Governor Greg Gianforte is planning to spend upwards of $300 million for rural Montana. In recent news, some of the ARPA money from the pandemic will be going towards getting high-speed internet for the rural communities in Montana, making it open to modernized remote work. This is, as Gover Governor Gianforte said, this project will provide services to nearly 62,000 homes, businesses, and farms in ranches in Montana particularly in rural Montana. Tuesday, our Missoula, uh, uh, R, uh, to, uh, sorry, it's, it, the grammar is all over the place, but the title is Our Missoula on Tuesday did a kickoff event that brought folks from all over Missoula, from individuals to organizations with a stake in Missoula's future. And so Our Missoula is the growth policy that we've seen um, implemented over the last couple of years in the city of Missoula as a way to build higher density in certain aspects of the area. But one of the big takes away from this is uh, that um, over 3,500 people gave, a lot, gave input on this program before it was fully initialized in what would be called Title 20, which is like every 10 years the city comes up with a downtown master plan to kind of figure out how they want to grow uh, based on population trends and stuff like that. So, so far this had folks bring up very common concerns from growth inwards and not getting carried away with the aesthetic of the neighborhoods while also making a turnkey permitting process for developers to work within uh, their means. Uh, this has been an ongoing thing and from what we saw from Monday's meeting some of the uh, things that city wants might be too much to ask for from developers. The Monday meeting which lasted over six hours about the riverfront property uh, as they began to talk about the new neighborhood. I mean of course I'll talk more about my city council report but the main point is that I wanted to make is that a lot of folks are kind of concerned about uh, uh, potential infrastructure, roads. When you build all these new neighborhoods and all these things the, one of the biggest concerns and a lot of comment that goes to the city council and a lot of things has to do with sidewalks, roads, things that are just not available to uh, immediate amenities to be able to even get into those kind of uh, wayfinding sites, um, other buzzwords and other stuff like that. But the main point was is that they, they, they're worried about the infrastructure around the places that are being built in which the city is working on doing a rezoning to help influence some of the deal. So the meeting kind of was on the heels and a lot of the big issues behind the reason why it was so long is a lot of city council members try to put in amendments to add them things with this as well. But um, kind of going back to uh, uh, the affordable housing, that's one of the main reasons why this growth inward is such a big deal. And most houses I've seen on Zillow or anything online has settled over uh, pretty much $500,000, uh, you know, half a million dollars for your typical homes that used to be maybe three fifty. dollars 250 at at the minimum back before the 2020 update for the uh, uh, for the um, from the Missoula Housing Authority, which saw big jumps and leaps in uh, how, uh, how um, prices for houses. Well, taxes have increased and will go on into effect in January, which includes county and city accumulating to about 25 percent of if you live in the city and the county uh, is only paying about 40 to 60 dollars per month extra than what's on top of this. And I mean, I just looked at my county taxes recently. It's definitely sitting just a little above $3,000 for county taxes between city and county and my property taxes. And when I moved in, it was pretty much sitting at uh, $2,100. So it's kind of interesting that the, over the last four years, I've seen my property taxes go up by a whole thousand dollars just in the last four years. So just wanted to give you a little note, just kind of like seeing how some of the trends and some of the changes that are happening in the city of Missoula as well. Um, and, you know, on the other hand, one of the major things that are also happening is that uh, uh, annexations of certain properties and uh, just a lot of different new developments that are being created. Uh, within the next few, few years, Missoula can definitely see that there's going to be a bigger increase in their tax base. Be, so th th it's, 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 it's interesting, but the uh, immediate need for uh, the, the capital to keep the lights on in the, in the city is uh, interesting for sure as we're going into it a little bit more. So a lot of people are frustrated. I'm frustrated with higher taxes. But but on the other end, services by the city are increasing and new positions are being created to, uh, uh, to uh, meet demand for permitting for developers and the housing services to help with affordable housing and homelessness as we are waning off the COVID relief money. So there's a kind of the big uh, talking points I wanted to uh, get into a little bit more, but I'm going to jump right in and talk uh, and show you guys uh, Saturday teas. And these are the videos that were created by the kids last Saturday and a couple Saturdays ago, um, just from our Saturday drop-ins, which we do every Saturday from one to three. So if you have a kid between the ages of eight and 14, they like stop animation, they want to do some Lego movies,
movie making, that kind of stuff, MCAT's the place to be, and it's every Saturday from 1 to 3. And here's our tease, and when I come back, we're going to talk about some movies. You are me, but just We're gonna go on an adventure today. Stay away from my treasure. <laughs> Things are getting cold out there in Missoula, and MCAT is doing Winter Days Camp. For three days, kids get a chance to make their imagination come to life in a series of hands-on learning from stop animation, filmmaking, and more. We have cameras, computers, and various Legos, and props to enhance their videos. Create, share, and repeat in this three-day workshop where kids collaborate and work on some of their own projects. Winter Days Camp at MCAT inside the award-winning Missoula Public Library. Sign up now at MCAT.org. 
Hey guys, welcome back. Let's kick things off with some pre-critic. Hey, I don't want to be caught wearing alien face, but here's a couple uh, uh, movies that are coming out this weekend. Uh, get waterboarded with a movie that's just coming out in a time where most folks, especially in my community, would rather just pass on going to movies in general. While the creator, James Cameron, has his name notoriety for this film, it makes it clear that unless this movie can stand on its own and not have the futurist bump, we can expect folks to nitpick the fact that this is just another reflection of colonization in an advanced society meets a native indigenous population. It doesn't usually go well with those two combinations. Maybe it's the Anglo-Saxon in us, or um, maybe it's a Maybelline. Um, watch Sam Worthing, Worth Nothington, uh, who coasted on the fame of the past Avatar, get another chance to bore us to death while we look at pretty pictures of CGI'd uh, mapped environments, including now water. Uh, the Almond and the Seahorse. Uh, you watch yet another, it's like, it's kind of like the shark and the octopus or whatever. Whatever, the, the bunch of those indie films that always have to have like, oh, here's one thing and here's another thing. Watch an indie film starring uh, deflated Rebel Wilson as she deals with a traumatic brain injury and decides to go on, go method and become an architect who has to deal with uh, the mental issue and find a way to deal with her new normal and something about a metaphor for a title which is almond, full of protein, a source of strength and a seahorse, which means the guy gets pregnant and the lady gets to live her dreams for once. Anyways, enjoy a movie where your partner becomes a burden, and frankly, it's a heavy topic. Uh, as we get older, we have to depend on family for things we've never thought we did. So enjoy a bummer of a film that slaps you in the face with a thing of reality. Ah, uh, yes. This is actually a sequel of Ernest and uh, Celeste. Celestine is a trip to... Uh, Gubberatia, uh, which is basically just, you know, it's kind of like Babe Pig in the City, but for kids' French movie. Enjoy a French animated film that will make you go, they'll probably win in all European awards, but maybe get a mention in the U.S. Oscars or for foreign film. This sequel shows that two animals from different backgrounds go to the big city and deal with new and familiar forms of racist speciesism with a footloose hook of banning music in bear country. The country bears would be rolling in their graves. Um, music has the power to influence motion, so enjoy a series of folks with tragic backgrounds heal through the power of music, I assume. All right, so this is the, uh, those are the lists. Up next, we have a fun dubbing stuff from The Great Rupert, which is a 1950s movie, and when I come back, we're going to talk all about city council. Well, ho, 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 and a ho, ho, ho. Hey, family, I got ourselves a tree. Ah. Nobody ever tells me anything. Ah, oh, that tree looks amazing. Oh, my tree is just terrible. It's so tall. How do they even get it in here? Is that you, honey? Probably more than one guy. Oh, where are you going? Do you see the tree? Isn't it amazing? Dad, what are you doing with that old bush? Uh, now you listen here. There's no way to talk to your mother. I got this great deal from this nice man who's do going door to door. Uh, we can't afford this in this economy. What are you doing? Nonsense. Most people take a loan out anyways. Even poor people deserve a rich Christmas. The tree guy threw in the turkey when he hit it with his car. Well, did you save the receipts? <laughs> What's that? Wow, I think I'm going through seasonal depression. We can't afford this. Oh, listen, honey, your credit's good. No, you no, can no, trust... are you kidding me? My credit's terrible. I just didn't want to pray to Gaia this oh, year. the winter solstice ain't good enough for you? It's the earth that provides, not some magical man in red. I didn't buy into this hippie crap just because it saved money. I exclusively did it because it saved money. You know how long it's going to take me to pay for this? But Henry Winkler said that if we get a reverse mortgage... A reverse mortgage? This is... This is going to affect the legacy of our kid here. Is that what you want? Henry Winkler coming into oh, your house and stealing days. it? happy days. Happy days. I just love the fawns, don't you, honey? Oh, please, just sit down. You know that if you stand for a long period of time, your blood rushes from your head? Oh, daddy, daddy, please say you're going to be okay. Maybe we'll get him some water. Uh, not really. Uh, oh, come on, honey. This... It's not all bad. We have each other. I don't know. This doesn't feel good. Oh, and I got another surprise for you. I went gambling again. Yeah, Mom really made a killing. Let me show you my winnings. It was quite a big pull. At this rate, I don't think we're going to have another Christmas. Oh, nonsense. Well, let me tell you something. They installed this new Kino machine, oh. and I decided to pull the lever. Oh, just get it over with. And from this box, you will see all the money that I was able to get. Whoa! Check this out. Stacks on stacks uh. on stacks. Uh. I was able to afford that tree. Oh. We were able to get a free turkey out of it, too. Oh, jeez. The roadkill turkey? Uh, oh, yeah. yes. Uh? Well, I'd feel more comfortable if you put that in the bank. <laughs> 
isn't this wonderful? Yeah, Daddy, isn't a Christmas miracle? Mwah, mwah. Well, <laughs> guess the fawn's done it again. Oh, and another thing, I lost my job. We'll talk about that later. I definitely enjoyed that last one when I filmed it. Anyways, let's jump right into your city council report. Uh, kicking things off at the top of the meeting, uh, City Council Member Sandra Vasekar voted down additional funding for the Johnson Street Winter Shelter. And this is what she had to say about that. It is the extra uh, $35,900 for the Johnson Street Winter Shelter. Uh, it's a little bit confusing in the um, referral because we the city council, the majority of the city council originally had the contract for $350,000 and then um, this was increasing it for $385,900. So it is just an ad additional $35,900. Um, I disagree with the funding mechanism uh, through ARPA, the American Rescue Plan Act funds. I disagree with that and then I also, um, <clears throat> We are, as I mentioned on Wednesday, we are stewards of our um, of all of our constituents' tax dollars, and not everybody is um, too fond of the uh, Johnson Street Shelter. And so I, I felt like um, since the three hundred fifty thousand dollars was already approved, um, I feel like that was enough. And then if um, folks do feel that strongly um, about this shelter, then um, they nobody's stopping them from giving a financial donation or any other um, donations to the shelter on their own accord. I just dropped off some toilet paper and sweatshirts and socks the other day. Um, and I would encourage folks to do that. So I just wanted to uh, speak about why I'm gonna be voting no on that tonight. Okay. And so that was one of the uh, many topics that were uh, presented in the meeting. Uh, the point, that this was part was a, a part of the consent agenda and the city voted to add additional funding for uh, personnel and operations at the Johnson Winter sh site. Um, but wrapping up the new district to fund improvements after the federal post office building gets acquired by city county governing bodies. Uh, you heard the benefit from this building and improvements will be phased in as the money becomes available through the city county. We'll share the cost for maintaining operating this new building so it's going to be an interlocal uh, government building between city and county and it's going to cost both city and county uh, accumulatively somewhere between 14 and 16 million dollars to get moved in and operate in this building and uh, overall they said that uh, based on trends and all the uh, government uh, land leasing is that they'd spend more if they keep doing the same thing now than to acquire a free building and just get it modernized for their immediate needs. So Stacey Anderson reflects on this and this is what she had to say much better deal to the taxpayers than what we're currently seeing um and that the number you know 40 million dollars was you know not anywhere in the realm of what we are looking to spend it is more in the seven million or such and i really encourage everyone who has questions or concerns to go back and listen to um the committee meeting where um that john adams really presented a really thorough um presentation of the numbers, what, you know, the fact that we've been using, uh, utilizing a um, consultant to go through and kind of deem out various costs. And so we're not going into this blind and that um, it will really meet a lot of our immediate needs and future needs. And it will give us opportunities to consolidate and hopefully serve the community better, which is what the city of Missoula, you know, what is municipal government is for. We're here for the service of the citizens. So not only is it balance pay, uh, balancing taxpayer dollars and being efficient with those, but it's also providing for hopefully more efficient and better uh, public service. Yep. Many other city council members echoed uh, her comments as well as being a net positive for the city of Missoula and also the county. Uh, government leasing on, in the long term will accumulate to more than what the city and county would have paid for rehabilitation and operation of the old post office. So, uh, which, you know, they get it for free, FYI. Planning for home and uh, CBDG, uh, CDBG block grants are in full swing as they move towards to mend this to include current and future potential projects. Not much to talk about, but to expect uh, from a uh, constant update on grants going towards affordable housing and uh, building infrastructure using some of those block grants. So the big topic this evening, of course, was Lower Miller Creek, the riverfront neighborhood. Um, the new neighborhood down Lower Miller Creek, uh, final step to get uh, new motions after this week's meeting to reflect costs and services provided by developers, which include portions of the road and roundabouts, uh, character overlay, and uh, spoke about potential commercial mixed use. Here's uh, Doug Bodegard, and he's a resident of this particular area and this is what he had to say. It's very, very clear to me that 
the only way that we're going to be able to overcome these these zoning things is to get involved. Um, I still do not believe that um, it's in our best interest not to have some commercial out there. I just really believe in uh, reducing car traffic, but we are um, here, be, you know, we're where we're at because of the code. So anyway, I just encourage people to get involved, but thank you all. I appreciate your time. Yep. So there was a good uh, amount of back and forth as the city was throwing in amendments and uh, asking for uh, different kinds of things. Uh, when Doug referred to was Tuesday night's meeting that look, took place at the fairgrounds to talk about Title 20, our Missoula growth policy that focuses on higher density growth. But for what I've seen in this, uh, uh, these rezones have been happening further and further away from the city of Missoula and closer to boundary lines between city and county. So um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm like thinking of two different things at the same time, but the, the main point is that um, Doug did were uh, not necessarily uh, about this particular thing, but in terms of the uh, downtown master plan and how uh, it's affecting uh, pop up uh, neighborhoods in these kind of uh, higher density areas, um, just kind of like on the outskirts rather than what uh, originally our Missoula was kind of based on, which was to grow inward. But you can't really grow inward when you're on the outskirts. So Jeremy Keene, city engineer, speaks about the roundabout during this presentation because that was one of the big topics that they uh, spent a lot of time talking about. So here's Jeremy Keene about the potential um, added roundabout in this particular Lower Miller Creek area. So there's a thousand units that are going to all benefit from this roundabout at that intersection. And part of our long range planning was to extend street networks, including connecting Christian Drive with this roundabout at Lower Miller Creek Road. So, so the round, the need for the roundabout is really more about planning for the whole neighborhood to develop than just one development. And so that that's why our recommendation was to to look at the traffic analysis and determine a proportional share for those costs. And, you know, towards the end, you know, uh, one of the amendments that were brought up was that they wanted to uh, essentially make the uh, the developer pay 100 percent of the uh, cost for the roundabout. And then, you know, this is something that sometimes the city does is they want to see where they could put the costs more on one end versus the other in long terms. You know, so this is uh, this is uh, one of the guys from the developers and this is Spencer Weath. He's Spencer Engineering. And he speaks to the developers in response to uh, the uh, developer having to pay the full cost of the roundabout. So I understand that Riverfront Trails does benefit and we're fine paying our proportionate share of whatever that benefit is. The city determined that the traffic that goes through there is 35%. We'll pay our 35%. I think it's unfair to burden one developer understanding that what the council is saying, but at the same token, there's another 400 new lots that are going to be market rate that are going to go in just above this. So if this developer fronts it, would there be latecomer fees for the new developers that are going to use the same roundabout up further in Linda Vista? Or is this burden being put on this developer because he happens to have a project at the same time that the city has a project and we already had a plan? And so we're kind of getting hit on this particular thing. There's, as uh, Mr. Keene said, there's a thousand lots that are benefiting from this. We have a proportionate share, and that is great. We have offered the city. It didn't work out uh, the way uh, for the configuration of the roundabout, but we actually offered land to give to the city to get the roundabout all onto our property to try and make sure that we could expedite the, the construction process. Unfortunately, the engineering didn't quite work. And, you know, part of this is like finding out ways so to, you know, mitigate costs and try to avoid having uh, higher SIDs to the neighborhood, in particular, the people who are impacted. But in the end, it just uh, kind of went back and forth for a, like a solid like three and a half, four hours with breaks in between. And in the end, um, and after more than an hour talking about funding options, Stacey Anderson withdrew this amendment altogether because it would make it an obstacle for developers that may not want to commit to a project based on the parameters. Delay costs you know, money for a lot of developers. If they're not every every month, everything is like tens of thousands of dollars that are being wasted. And another portion of the meeting was develop the character and the uh, kind of like the character overlay. And that was one of the big things that were kind of a big thing of Missoula a couple of years ago. I mean, before the pandemic, when, um, you know, houses were being torn down and being built up to be like giant kind of like uh, monstrosities that don't match the character overlay of certain neighborhoods. So and many concerns about this is that they're really worried about, you know, having large buildings, you know, one of the they went a lot of back and 
they went a lot back and forth with a senior uh, living. It would be like, hey, if it doesn't turn out to be senior living, there's no guarantee it's going to be senior living because it's zoned for that kind of thing. So they wanted to kind of stress that they want to be like, oh, maybe this could be uh, assisted living, not just senior living. So that was one of the um, things as well. They also talked about uh, the re religious assembly uh, portion of the property, which I really didn't get touched on when the details of the potential height requirements of the church which, you know, they, they basically threw an amendment that says, like, you can't go over 35 feet for height of a building uh, uh, of, of the potential church, whatever that church t may be. So there's a lot going on in the planning in this uh, new neighborhood and spending upwards of five hours on this riverfront property has uh, approved a series of zoning and certain restrictions on building size and boundaries, as I mentioned in this report. There's really not much to it. Like, there was just a lot of back and forth, and there's just not much going on. And, you know, like, it just in general, like, you know, these kind of meetings would be like, oh, okay, I have a lot to talk about. I was like, no, there's, it feels like there's less to talk about in some of these meetings because of it. So that's how the uh, city council kind of ended is that they kind of ended where they, uh, they ended where they were from the very beginning, but they had a couple of amendments. They had a couple of wins just to be able to uh, restrict and have some kind of idea to remain the character of the neighborhood and not get, you know, uh, completely um, bombarded with high density, even though they do have components for high density as well. And also just for basic views of the area so people can actually have a decent view on their property. So. You know, I could, you know, I could talk a little bit more about this, but I'm going to kind of move on and I'm going to jump right into Committee of the Whole. And, you know, this is, uh, I have no videos for this particular thing, but the city has undertaken, intends to undertake certain projects, including improvements on Eaton Street, which is called the 2023 project. The city has determined that this is the best uh, interest of the city and its inhabitants of the road district to finance the 2023 project in, 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 in incidental, um, incidental costs and therefore including costs of insurance through this insurance of uh, uh, revenue bonds payable from the uh, revenues. Another one related to bond revenue structure where they want to dip into parks district improvements to the west side playground, major repairs or replacements of the north side pedestrian bridge, improvements to Karis Park Pavilion, improvements to uh, the Bonner uh, Park band shell, major uh, big win for the city a city band for the Bonner Park band shell, major maintenance and repair with respect of the 50 meter swimming pool at Splash Montana, and uh, re uh, replacing 12 tennis courts at Playfair Park and related projects. So this is collectively called the 2023 project in terms of what they do with their roads and parks district. So another uh, big topic was how the city planned to move forward with the 2023 legislature, but this is actually gonna be a big deal as it's going to affect the Higgins Street corridor. So Higgins Street, um, there's always, a, there's, a, there's you know, four lanes of traffic uh, at any given time, but they wanna uh, consolidate this basically from 3rd Street to about 6th Street, leading up to Brook Street and they wanted to consolidate the lanes from four lanes to three lanes with a, actually more three lanes with the center lane and uh, additional spacing for bike lanes. So uh, they spoke about the Missoula growth policy. The update rolled out with what was called community launch uh, phase of the public outreach Tuesday night stream. Um, so far they had community leaders. Uh, wait, 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 hold on. Oh, anyways, um, I'm kind of getting off topic as, uh, I was talking about something that has to do, like I, I like after the Tuesday night thing with the Q, the R Missoula community kickoff, there's just a lot of moving parts and just a lot of feedback and just how they want to move the future in terms of planning of Missoula. But we're gonna actually jump back right into that uh, uh, Higgins corridor as I was trying to get into, the, like I, I lost my momentum, but I'm trying to pick it back up. So Brooks to Broadway corridor, continue to talk about the uh, changing from four lanes to two lanes. Aaron Wilson, city engineer, talks about the new plans for this area in this presentation. This is what he had to say. It's, it's been a little while since we present, last presented to council. I think at the, the time that we did last, um, we, we were examining a number of different um, alternatives to the corridor. So we were looking at um, some different ways that we could address the, the issues we have. We, we went through a public involvement round um, and we've since done an, a, a more analysis, reviewed all that public involvement and developed what we think it would be the, the recommended alternative um, given the, the goals of this study that we, we set out to achieve for the corridor. So what I have to go through today, I wanna start with just an overview of our project goals and objectives, um, cause I think it's important when we're evaluating um, the existing conditions of Higgins versus 
potential changes that are included in the, the recommended alternative. Um, to understand what we're trying to achieve in this corridor and the issues that we're facing today. Uh, All right, so uh, one of the big uh, moves is that uh, during this presentation, one of the things that they want to emphasize is safety of this particular area. Um, so far, the idea was basically single lanes for uh, from Hellgate High School, Brook Street to Third Street, which is a stretch of what we call the hip strip. A center lane for a left turn would be used for space, and all other spaces would benefit bike travel. Aaron talks about the benefits uh, from Higgins to the downtown area, and here is the project Vision. Corridor should be safe as the primary gateway into downtown. The, um, the, the first thing people often see is they're coming into downtown Missoula. Um, we want it to be safer for, for all people, whether you're biking, walking, driving, taking the bus, that, that this should first and foremost be a safe corridor to travel along. We also wanted to, to have an inviting streetscape that, again, Higgins is a destination. People go there, to be there. There are businesses. Um, it's not just a corridor that is moving people through as quickly as possible, uh, like you might find on an interstate or a highway, that this this corridor itself is a destination, and we want to really showcase um, Higgins as the center of our downtown. All right. So that was Aaron Wilson uh, talking more about that. Um, mitigating traffic and making it safer a place for folks to enjoy things and encouraging a slower area to benefit street side businesses access and make it a destination. Having a left turn lane and worrying about not uh, only one but two lanes of oncoming traffic um, w was a bit of a headache but maybe this would also uh, decrease the use of the uh, le like um, when they turn on the flash on the le no left turn light so that would be a part of this. And then uh, Aaron also talks about uh, the current uh, concerns in terms of tra traffic collisions. Some of the issues with what we see today on Higgins um, and where we think we're really falling short on those goals. Um, first is, again, coming back to safety. Uh, we see approximately 55 crashes per year. That's just over one crash a week, um, which may not sound that high, but that is every, every time you have a crash, there's potentially someone injured, there is cost associated with that, there is delay associated with that. Um, we also see four bike, approximately four bike crashes a year, um, at least one ped crash a year. Again, those numbers are fairly small and they fluctuate from year to year. Um, but we're seeing a, around 12 injuries per year as well. So people are getting injured in these crashes. They aren't just uh, fender benders or side swipes or property damage. All right, so, um, you know, Bikers and pedestrians are getting hit more outside of cars than those are in the safety of their cars. On the other hand, with uh, the schools nearby, Hellgate High School has a lot of kids leaving, building for lunch, coming and going to school. Aaron talks about uh, my least favorite sign, the uh, no left turn sign on both uh, on, go, if you're going down Higgins, and uh, reflects a little bit more about that. Hey. And then business access, there, there are a number of issues. Again, we, we don't have left turns along a big portion of this, this portion of the Higgins corridor. So if you're trying to go to a business just off of Higgins or trying to get to a parking structure um, or a parking that is off of Higgins, that, that you're not able to do that. Or if you are trying to bike through this corridor, um, you may have challenges getting to those businesses that you want to get to um, and provide that access that really makes this, again, a destination. People are going to Higgins for, for all these services and, and uses, and we want to facilitate that to the greatest extent possible. All right. And actually, I'll just oh, point out on this on. screen that you'll notice that if you're southbound at 6th, you can't turn left and you can't turn right um, due to the one way. And so that is sort of the definition of lack of access. You have to continue on the street if, if you don't know where you're going, then you're onto Brooks, there's limited turns there, and you could be circling a, a number of blocks to get where you wanna go. So it's really emphasizing the through movement um, as the priority, which is is not really the, the purpose that we see uh, for Higgins today. All right, sorry. Uh, yeah, there, there, I wrote a note on there to, uh, uh, you know, especially stop on that pause. But other than that, I think, uh, um, you know, picture is worth a lot more words than what we've been talking about. And so here's Aaron Wilson with an actual rendering of what this uh, concept could actually look like for the uh, south side of the bridge, which is also going to affect the north side of the bridge as well as they're trying to consolidate some of the traffic. But we're, we're constrained in space here a little bit. So we lose uh, several blocks of parking on one side of the street. It's not the entire length of the, the west side of Higgins. Um, from the river to Brooks, but uh, the three blocks kind of in the middle between 4th and 6th. So we're 
we think we're able to to maintain parking between Fifth and Brooks, at least a few of those spaces um, for the businesses that that are in that particular block. Um, and then we're able to preserve all the parking uh, in front of Guilds and Betty's in that block between Third and Fourth. So there's some parking loss uh, on the south side, but otherwise looks very similar to the the north side of the bridge. And then you know uh, one of the you know major things is that they're they're trying to uh, accumulate for the idea that you know when you're going off Brook Street, you're basically going on two left turns as you're jumping right onto Higgins. And one of the things that they wanted to address is that okay, so they they want to make sure that the right lane going into that area would be more of a uh, passageway to get onto Sixth Street because one of the major things is that if you wanted to get um, to um, you know from South Reserve kind of area to the university area. Sure, you can go down South Avenue, but uh, there's also going down Sixth Street. If you especially live up on the th uh, Third Avenue and you want to go all the way down on Third, jump on to um, Fifth and then go all the way up to the university. That's just one of the things that um, y you may have to adjust just because there, a lot of people turn right. Um, towards the university after they get onto Higgins. And so, and then there's a good chunk of people who are usually used to going, like keep on going straight. So there's those two lanes there that have that, have to deal with the fact that there might be a couple people merging back in and having to relearn how to drive in the downtown Missoula area. So that's just kind of like one of the things kind of uh, going on. And th this is just uh, information only. I just wanted to stress that because the city, um, Aaron Wilson and doing some studies just to determine what would be the best option moving forward, you know, help mitigating traffic, help slow things down you know the more lanes of traffic you have the less visibility that you may have to for, for folks just crossing the street in general Aaron did go into detail about elimination of two lanes and said that this would um, uh, model basically a 50 percent reduction in these crashes overall they send out surveys and have strong leanings to some of these changes in the area concerns of congestions amount of parking reduction parallel parking with single lanes in intersections another is another big topic this isn't uh, just a city street but part of the uh, Montana Department of transportation and it affects the bridge which isn't owned by the city per se so there's a whole nother possibility but however because they have MDD property involved they could also get state funding to improve the corridor in general so the costs don't uh, get uh, put on uh, local government bodies so think about that moving forward and then Aaron talks about the high volume of traffic on any given day um, in response to a city council members question we did look the section of Higgins between 5th and Brooks or sort of 5th and 6th and Brooks is Highway 12. Um, and you see a lot more, a lot higher volumes in that, that section of the corridor. It goes up by four or 5,000 vehicles a day, um, give or take. I can't remember the exact numbers, but um, in our work with the, with the State Department of Transportation, we really wanted to preserve the capacity as much as possible on Highway 12. And we were able to, base, just based on the configuration and the left turn prohibitions and things, we were able to maintain those lanes connecting Brooks to six, so the right turn lanes. You have two lanes going up north from Brooks to sixth, um, maintaining that right turn lane onto sixth for that corridor, and then maintaining two travel lanes from fifth up to Brooks so that you then, as you get to Brooks, you have the right turn lane and the through lane. So we're able to maintain the existing vehicular capacity in that section between Fifth and Brooks, um, where we have Highway 12 and, and much higher volumes. So so that was, I, I think, a, a really a, a good aspect of this design that we were able to accommodate the vehicular and the, the highway movements, as well as add in the, the safety benefits and the protected bike lanes. Yep. And, you know, we're also very fortunate to live in a downtown area in which a lot of the roads are a little much wider than if you would go to any other more urban areas in other bigger cities. And so there's a lot of opportunity for us to kind of uh, stretch and uh, basically stretch our legs in that. So there's a very popular right turn as soon as you get on Higgins from Brooks. And they wanted to make sure that the d designs are reflective of keeping folks in the correct lanes moving forward through these intersections. Uh, since this was information only, it will be up to folks to decide how to reflect on this project through meetings and and uh, if you want to um, give your feedback, you can go to engagemissoula.com. You can give out comment. Um, you can talk about your concerns, ask some questions. And they're usually pretty good about responding as well. So um, that's pretty much it for my city council report. I don't know if I have any other videos I want to show you guys before I jump in on there. But I think I might just go right into some uh, events that are happening this weekend. It's going to feel like a little short of a show as well. So let's talk about some of the main events that are happening um, in, the, in terms of this holiday season for this weekend starting today.
today. We got Empower Place is joined for their second annual Christmas bash at Empower Place. This is at the Missoula Food Bank. Santa will be on hand for photos and storytelling starting at 10 a.m. They'll have gingerbread house buildings and ornaments and creating station, plenty of sweet treats. On top of that, with the Missoula Food Bank, it's a great opportunity for people to get fresh, nutritious food. And also, it's very cheap for people of different economic standings. It's great for anybody who just wants to get cheap, nutritious food. Uh, and it's going to be open until about 1 p.m. today, so uh, that's per purview to reflect the Empower Place. Developmental and preschool school screening clinics. These are important, especially when you're trying to figure out uh, some kids who are aged zero to five and the see just before they get into the school system, see if they've been immunized and all sorts of things like that. You can get in contact with the St. Ignatius Elementary School. This is just basically uh, preschool screening clinics. I remember taking those when I was a kid. You know, it's like, do you hear a beep? And then, you know, ear testing and all that stuff. Raise your hand if you hear a beep. You know, that those kind of fun things back in the day just to, de to determine if we're healthy and we're developing properly. DraftWorks Christmas Steamer is going to happen. Uh, DraftWorks uh, is going to be hosting a, a Christmas Steamer that day. And also uh, a big uh, shout out to Gary Gillette. A bunch of him and they're uh, going to be doing their own version of a uh, uh, Santa Con over at DraftWorks. Uh, it's called Tuba Santa. They'll be playing some Oompa Tuba music um, in, in vein of the holidays starting at 6 p.m. at the DraftWorks tonight as well. And I will probably be there filming it. So um, Lights Under the Big Sky um, is, uh, is, an is also an event in a place um, in Ronan, Montana. It's going to start at 5 p.m. It's for uh, all ages, Christmas market, kids activities, Santa, horse, wagon rides, and more. If you haven't seen those uh, uh, horse uh, drawn carriage around Missoula on Saturday, uh, you should totally check them out. They're totally fun to do just to jump in the carriage and just enjoy a nice little carriage ride down Pine Street just uh, downtown over there. Ugly sweater party. So yeah, there's a lot of ugly sweater parties happening tonight as well. Craig Stan Public House is doing an ugly sweater. Glacier Ice Rink is doing an ugly sweater. Skate. Um, and also, if you're interested in becoming a socialist, Union Club <laughs> is happening at 6 p.m. John Floridas Benefit uh, for Soft Landing is doing a three-night fundraising event, kicking things off with a long staff house. Um, this is for uh, benefiting Soft Landing of Missoula. And Soft Landing is an organization that helps people from other countries, refugees, and more find a place called home in Missoula, Montana. Um, dueling pianos, holiday edition is going to be at Staven Hoop. Um, Saturday, your Winter Valley Winter Market. If you still want some of that farmer market charm, you can go to the Southgate Mall for the uh, Missoula Valley Winter Market from 9 to about 1 p.m. You have free present wrapping stations going to be at the Zootown Arts Community Center. I know that Missoula Public Library also has a, a gift wrapping station here at the Makerspace. You're going to have to check out Missoula Public Library's website online to figure out those times when there's open hours to do so. Story time, special visitor at the Missoula Public Library and by special visitor uh, during the holidays, you can do the math for story time. And it's going to be story time at 10.30 a.m. on Saturday. Art Blizzard uh, is going to be at Missoula Public Library at 11 a.m. Vaughn Common Studio for their annual Holiday Bazaar. Shop one kind of local art, ceramics, and jewelry created by 25 local artists. And it's going to be in the Cooper Room, Level 4. This is going to be Saturday from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. And this is to the, for the beautiful... Uh, Missoula Public Library. So you can go on the fourth floor in the Cooper Room and they're going to have their own kind of blizzard in a ways. So it's a, it's a bazaar. It's, it's a bunch of people selling stuff. Anyways, if you want photos with Santa, they're doing a Sweet Barns. Uh, the Sweet Barns is doing photos with Santa for the last weekend, 17th and 18th, from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. and it's going to be at the Sweet Barns. Cookie Decorating and Crafts. Missoula Public Library is doing a, a, a cookie decorating at the Missoula Art Box, which is on the second floor, from 2 to 4 p.m. Join Santa to decorate cookies, listen to Christmas music, and make holiday crafts. And then John, John Floridas is going to be at the um, Imagination Brewing Company for another holiday benefit concert for Missoula Youth Homes. Uh, and that's going to wrap up your uh, Saturday holiday events. Uh, Sunday, you got breakfast with Santa at the carousel. Santa Claus is going to be at the carousel. A carousel from Missoula is hosting a small entry feast where you can visit with Santa. A carousel from Missoula enjoy carousel rides and light breakfast snacks. Age four to adults are five dollars. Age three and under are free. The event runs from uh, 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. Reservations are encouraged. Youth Workshop, Spectacular Snow People, the Clay Studio of Missoula, is hosting a workshop which will be in the new Clay Studio Annex of 1110 Hawthorne Street, Unit C. Uh, create fun for the holiday season, young students age 8 to 12. 
up and can enjoy a create a snow person that will never melt. Make fun, funky snow person for your sh uh, shelf or countertop. These sculptures are a blast to create and make excellent seasonal decorations. Um, skate with Santa Sunday at the Glacier Ice Rink starting at noon. You get to skate with Santa. Uh, the Grinch. Uh, he's stopping by Ten Spoon Winery at 1 p.m., um, which is up the Rattlesnake. Holiday Ice Extravaganza Show. Glacier Ice Rink is doing a holiday show which is now full of swing and we have a perfect event to add to your calendars. The Holiday Ice Extravaganza is starting at 2 o'clock, 2.15 at the Glacier Ice Rink. This is the Missoula Figure Stating Club and different do a bunch of skate numbers, solars, and duets. So it's an event that's happening there. Come Ye Faithful, a service of lesson and carols. The, uh, the uh, the UCC, which is uh, the University of Montana's own church, um, joined the UCC Channel Choir and Orchestra as they perform Hal Hopkins' works. Come all ye faithful, a, a service of lesson of carols at 4 p.m. Sunday, December 18th at UCC Missoula, 409 University Avenue. Hanukkah on ice. Hey, we didn't forget about you guys. Uh, Glacier Ice Rink is going to be hosting a Hanukkah on ice. The public menorah celebrates Jewish tradition, culture, and pride. Join us for the annual celebration open to a broader community in Missoula and surrounding areas as we light the giant menorah and celebrate Hanukkah with friends and community leaders. And then finally, Jordan Filaritis is going to wrap up their uh, um, fundraiser for the Missoula Interfaith Collaborative. This is going to be at Missoula First United Methodist, Methodist Church. Wrapping up his fundraising tour, cellist uh, Jennifer Sladen and drummer Ed Stalin will be the performance with John Filaritis in the concert for Missoula Inter Interfaith Collaborative at the First United Methodist Church. All right, finally, we got a holiday ball with Ed Norton Big Band. So if you like the jazz uh, sounding of the Ed Norton Big Band, named after Ed Norton, who is, a, uh, who is the best friend of uh, Jackie Gleason in The Honeymooners. I just learned that. And uh, that interview is going to be available uh, later this afternoon at 4 p.m. We're going to be premiering on our Facebook and our YouTube page. Music in Missoula is going to be kind of giving a nod to the Ed Norton Big Band, and they'll be performing at the Zootown Arts Community Center tonight as well. So those are your events happening this week as well. Um, are you guys excited for uh, the World Cup happening on Sunday as well? It starts at 8 a.m. It's going to be early morning because, you know, Qatar is going to be late in the evening at that particular time. So Argentina is going to take on France. Um, good luck to you guys. And for Wake Up Missoula, um, I'm Scott Ramp, and I hope you guys have a wonderful, wonderful uh, weekend. Here is an, uh, Gabriel Annam by uh, Josh Cook. <laughs>